Thanks very, very much, Steve. Th those of you who are watching online uh, and maybe regretting that you're not in Dublin, the people, the wet people in this room yeah. can tell you what you missed, uh, what you missed at lunchtime. It really blew up a storm there uh, over the last little while. Uh, on the serious side, you know, that we, we love, uh, we love doing hybrid conferences, don't we, folks? We love them, but the uh, at the same time. Uh, I know that to some extent the hybridity of this conference, that is to say the absence from Dublin of many of our colleagues, is something to do with the uh, the cost of accommodation here in Dublin and the ongoing crisis that that represents at various levels, obviously not just for scholars coming for a weekend conference, but for uh, for so many people in Ireland and really a reminder that uh, that the, the, the power and forces and uh, structures that are memorialized in so much of what we study are still very much with us uh, today. Uh, and that's a little bit of, I guess, what I'm going to try to talk about. I don't know, was that a was that a plausible uh, segue? But uh, anyway, street cred, what this history can teach journalism students today. Um, as I said at the start of this session this morning, I'm a, uh, uh, I, I, I'm an intruder here. Uh, I am not a scholar of ballads and broadsides. Uh, I'm a journalist and a journalism teacher. Uh, and, you know, anybody who knows anything about any field knows that when they look at a journalist, they're looking at a spoofer, basically someone who picks up a little shallow knowledge, uh, trots it out, probably gets it wrong, and then moves on to the next story. And, and, and in this case, um, I have actually written a proper paper, which is in the last volume of the Ballot Partners, Atkinson and Raud, uh, um, uh, volumes along the lines of the paper that I'm giving today. But I found when I came along to give the paper, that still didn't help, <laughs> that I am as uh, I'm as clueless about what I'm doing here uh, as I uh, as I ever uh, ever might have been. But in any case, being a journalist, being a legacy media journalist as I am and as I was or indeed to be a journalism academic as I am today uh, in this time is to be in a state of perpetual alarm about the risks to the profession of journalism from barbarians at the gate presumed to be tapping viral misinformation into their smartphones motivated by some mix of rage and mischief. And on the parapets, the defenders of journalism try desperately to protect the boundaries of the profession, but the weapons at their disposal can be blunt and unwieldy. Uh, and I want to talk about that struggle and talk about what this history can teach us. The image that I've got up here is Liberté de la Presse from about 1796 in France, uh, and I think captures a previous period of panic about the uh, the power of the of the of media of the, of the media of that time. I love the, the printers are looking cool as a breeze in the back of that picture, and the people in the front are losing their uh, losing their heads, trampling each other. Children are being corrupted, etc. Something like what happens on uh, TikTok today. Um, so in any case, from the defenders of uh, journalistic professionalism and autonomy, often seen as embodied in the norm of objectivity, it's quite common, be they academics or journalists, to see experiences such as the reporter's day-to-day -day grind and daily drudgery valorized as among the most positive virtues of journalism done properly. And what I've got on the screen here is a quote from a very good article from about 12 years ago by journalism scholars called Compton and Benedetti, arguing that the crisis in journalism, and insofar as the crisis in journal journalism was being addressed by so-called citizen journalism, journalism was nonetheless losing something. By the way, for those of you who aren't journalism academics, there is a massive crisis in journalism. You may have noticed. You may have noticed your newspapers closing down, shrinking in size, being poorly edited. For those of you who are, uh, you know, uh, proofreading buffs. So journalism is in a massive crisis. But say Compton and Benedetti, the turn to sort of user-generated material is no substitute for the day-to-day -day grind. Um, the um, what is lost is the daily drudgery of reporting, unheralded labor. So I've, you know, I've assigned this reading to my students for many years, and, and then it kind of occurred to me that if I was saying to them, we've got to save your daily drudgery, your, your daily grind and your unheralded labor, it's kind of no wonder they want to be influencers on Instagram and, and uh, YouTube celebrities. So it's into that kind of world that I'm, and into that kind of tension that I'm trying to introduce the uh, the question of uh, of 
what the news ballot and the, the tradition of the news broadsides can teach us. By the way, um, this article from Compton Benedetti also features some quotes from David Simon, who was the creator of the television series The Wire. And he, uh, one of the things that he says proper journalists do, as well as daily drudgery and day-to-day -day grind, is they go to bars with where police hang out. Any of you have seen The Wire know that that's the case, but I really think that's just a bridge too far to ask any young journalist to do. Um, so what if we conceive the news legacy less in terms of daily drudgery and more in terms of entertainment, of drama, of personality and personalization? How might, how might that sense of the legacy change the picture? And where does the kind of work that we've been discussing here today fit into a changed picture along those lines? And the image here, the execution of pirates in Hamburg, 1573, uh, a dramatic image indeed. This is, a, this is a fascinating image, and I wanted to, to use it to kind of try to historically conceptualize news and to understand that the conception of news that we, um, that we have mostly inherited from the generation when newspapers were a very important and, and powerful set of institutions is a, is a highly gendered one that associates news with certain kinds of, uh, of organizations, with certain kinds of media, et cetera. And this, uh, but this print from around the time that the newspaper was being invented, right around the beginning of the 1600s, is called the several places where you may hear news. Now, and it's it's a, quite a common image. It was uh, probably first published, something similar published in France in the late 1500s. This is an English version, but it's often called the several places where you hear gossip or tittle tattle. This is a version of it that's headlined tittle tattle. Um, in this case, though, I really like the fact that it says news and it locates news in essentially in women's sociality. It locates news in real places where people gather and speak. And, and, and they speak at the, uh, at the condit, the, the, at the well, at the down by the river, at the bakehouse, at the alehouse, uh, at the market. Um, and then the great one up in the corner, at the, at the hut, uh, looks like the sauna there, but up in the corner at the child bed. Some poor woman is giving birth there and all the other women are kind of uh, um, taking the opportunity to gossip in front uh, in front of her. But this this print, the several places where you he may hear news, and it's sort of coincidence with the emergence of the newspaper form in mostly in Amsterdam and then in England in the early 1600s, I think is interesting and reminds us of a different kind of, um, if you like, collectivity in which news is generated, not necessarily the um, that kind of singular space of the printed newspaper. And then there's also, in relation to print culture, the fallacy that sees news as being uh, essentially uh, what's embodied in, in periodicals. I don't have to tell this to this audience, but in general, given the origin of the term journalism in the journal, in the French newspapers, as well as of journalism training and education, which came up in the 20th century very much to train people to work in newspapers. All those things tend to privilege the idea of the periodical, be it weekly or daily. That compendium of mixed uh, news is the archetype of news production. And so what you're seeing on the screen here on the, on the left is what is usually regarded as the very first Irish newspaper. Um, there were five editions published of it in the spring of 1659. And uh, although the title is not a particularly snappy one, it is nonetheless, I think, a really good uh, description of what it is that's contained in a newspaper or a news book. They, they were called by different terms at the time. An account of the chief occurrences of Ireland, together with some particulars from England, and then the date on which these particular occurrences were gathered there. So this version of news, and when we talk about, uh, you know, the origins of news, people tend to turn to these 17th century news books, these accounts of the chief occurrences, these gazettes or whatever, is, is how we tend to see it. But the thing on the right is equally, to my mind, a uh, an emanation of how the 17th century reader and publisher and printer uh, experienced news. In other words, something big has happened. I'm going to produce something about it. Uh, I might throw in some bullshit along with the actual facts that I generate, 
And uh, we're going to have a one-off publication that is going to, you know, rather than, you know, waiting till the end of the week and sticking in some boring news book with a report on who appeared at court, we're going to do a, uh, we're going to do a, a little booklet, News from Holland, True, Strange, and Wonderful, A True Relation of the Strange Floating of Ice and Great Inundation, The Remarkable Discourse of a Child Found in Galen. In other words, all this stuff of popular journalism in the, in the 19th and 20th century, but outside the confines of the newspaper, instead in this other medium, this medium of the single document of the news um, of the event sheet you might actually think of it as like a uh, you know a documentary as opposed to like a news bulletin even when we come to john wilkes is often seen as a kind of a hero of of the 18th century a hero of the the conception of journalism as a counter to the uh, the power of the state uh, prosecuted for uh, seditious libel uh, uh, in particular for things written in his newspaper the north britain and the two copies of the paper are visible on the table there in Hogarth's print. Hogarth's print of John Wilkes with his Liberty Cap, a far more important document and far more widely published and widely read and widely known among the people of London and beyond than the actual editions of the newspaper that he published. So the, the, the print, this, the singular image of Wilkes is for me the, um, the real uh, element of a popular public sphere as opposed to a bourgeois public sphere. And I'm just going to pause to um, just on that term, the public sphere for a minute um, and do my journalism academic thing. Um, Jürgen Habermas uh, is famous for uh, popularizing this idea in a book in 1962. Uh, Einer Kategorie der Bürgerlichen Gesellschaft, apologies for the word German, a category of bourgeois life or a category of bourgeois society. That was one important aspect of the public sphere as far as Habermas was concerned, that it was intrinsically bourgeois. And then the second aspect of it, and it's interesting given how often we still hear talk of the public sphere today from people who cite Habermas, as far as he was concerned in 1962, 60 years ago, it was all over. There was no public sphere anymore. It had been killed off by mass consumer society. But that image of newspaper stories being read and debated in the coffee houses of the Enlightenment as the ver as our vision of what constitutes deliberative public life is still influential and it leaves little room for the ballad singer and the broadside hawker. Now I don't want to completely equate newspapers on the one hand with kind of bourgeois life and bourgeois ideology and class interests and non-newspapers as the uh, as the um, non-newspaper print material is the stuff of working class life. Um, newspapers do eventually become an important part of working class movements, of working class politics. Um, they, uh, and as Raymond Williams suggests, and I'll talk about him in a minute, um, the working class press of the 19th century very much builds on the tradition of popular ballads and, and popular broadsides. Uh, that uh, that preceded it, and to some extent, arguably, the popular newspaper ends up superseding the, uh, the the cheap print tradition as an expression of popular politics. So, Williams is great uh, example of uh, how uh, the the popularity of the non newspaper news tradition in early 19th century Britain are the various uh, sheets produced around the confession and execution of William Corder, who was uh, uh, tried and convicted of a, a sensational murder of a young lady, the Red Barn murder. And uh, you can see that there is, of course, a ballad on at least one of these, um, you know, by W. Corder. The ballad says, i.e., the, the, the pretense on the sheet is that Corder uh, wrote it himself. It's a bit of fake news, I think. But the um, but in any case, this um, this versions of this publication published and I mean, many of you know already execution uh, broadsides sold on the day of the execution, often uh, with a kind of a fictionalized version of what the last speech looked like in the scene of the execution as it took place, um, were uh, a, an extremely common aspect of uh, popular uh, print culture going back to the indeed all the way back to the. Uh, I think to the 16th century, and um, in this in this case, versions of the quarter story sold over a million copies uh, at a time when the Times was probably selling maybe two or three thousand copies a day. So uh, this is certainly, uh, you know, the in terms of the, what the mass of people were, were reading, uh, the archetypal artifact of popular news uh, consumption. 
but it also represents this kind of execution ballad. And the, one of the scholars of the execution ballad, Una uh, McIlvenny, uh, distinguishes the subversiveness and popularity of news ballads from other modes of news dissemination. Songs had the potential to provoke a more powerful response than other news sources. And McIlvenny treats the audience for news ballads as the furthest thing imaginable from that deliberative public sphere of bourgeois individuals. She treats them as a population who over several centuries of execution ballads produced and absorbed the same highly moralizing message from their ballads. And when they gathered at the gallows and they bought their uh, broadsides and they sang their songs, it always, they were always reminded that sin would be violently punished. And this analysis effectively locates the ballad and the broadside tradition on the side of the mass or the masses rather than in the individualistic bourgeois public sphere. Uh, I have I think that the distinction obviously gets soft at times. We know that often newspaper printers were also printing uh, ballads and broadsides. We know, I love uh, Catherine Ann Collins mentioned this morning about the sort of the newsroom of ballad singers gathering to organize their work in a, in a, in a highly um, sort of a division of labor sort of way. And even the people who published uh, this, the, uh, uh, the quarter uh, ballads were certainly uh, doing capitalism uh, in a in a big way, but I think nonetheless that the generalization about the uh, the ballad and broadside tradition as being on the side of the mass as opposed to the uh, the bourgeois makes the case for retrieving those values uh, today. Um, this is uh, while the idea of impartiality is emerging in reporting the likes of Joseph Sadler. Uh, you can read Catherine's great work on Sadler on the uh, Irish Traditional Music Archive website. Here, celebrating the glorious victory of the Pope's Brigade at Perugia. Again, more fake news that the Pope's Brigade got its ass handed to them by Garibaldi. Uh, but the um, so dubious uh, fact checking, but um, this idea of dubiously celebrating a partisan victory somewhere across Europe, uh, perhaps familiar to us uh, to this day. Um, and in Sadler's ballad about the, uh, the Pope's victory, at Perugia, we get some um, uh, criticism of the mainstream media there. Um, the lying times now be aware, for it is there many a snare, the truth to you I will declare. Um, the, the news, in reality, the news is great and glorious. Don't believe what you're reading in the lying times. Uh, just quickly then to talk about the, the work today that I think uh, represents the kind of uh, re emergence of something like a tradition of partiality, of partisanship, of entertainment, of um, and of uh, stark uh, political commitment. This, these are the essentially the top earning podcasts on the Patreon platform. These the people producing these platforms make a very decent living on them. And a substantial number of them, about half of these, the, these are all from the top 10 or top 12, are essentially current affairs podcasts, but current affairs podcasts that mix comedy with their, um, um, with their take on events. Red Scare is just, uh, just off the page here. I see my daughter saying, where's Red Scare? Red Scare is just down there at number seven or number eight. Um, and then TikTok. And my students have been insisting to me lately that TikTok is the place where, uh, where news is happening and where you can go and say Slava Ukraina um, and boom. Citrus as it's happening, often highly dramatized uh, here with the tradition of music. I'm um, and then here we, and we see TikTok then as a more traditional news delivery medium. This chat. Dementia in prison is turning into an epidemic. And of course, the United States prison system is not prepared. In the United States, we currently have a prison system where people are often locked up and the key is thrown away. And our prison system currently has an exorbitant amount of... So you can see he's actually integrating, he's, he's, he's doing commentary, he's integrating uh, work from other media. On the other hand, you then you have the Washington Post on TikTok uh, doing what it thinks the young people are into. I love to travel and see the world, but air travel creates carbon emissions that can contribute to climate change. So what can the airline industry do to lessen the impact of air travel on the environment? Hi, I'm Delilah Isabel, and I'm here to tell you how one airline is embracing new technology. Yeah, so advertorial uh, for United Airlines on TikTok from the Washington Post. So we see that the, uh, the, the values of commercialism uh, live on on the new, uh, on the new medium here. Uh, 
there's uh, this, I'm, I won't play the clip here, but this is an Indian YouTube channel that has about six and a half million subscribers, uh, completely independent of, uh, of any, and does really heartbreaking news from the streets uh, and has its kind of loyalty on the street, if you like, and uh, does, uh, is not connected to any major uh, outlet. In any case, sorry, I flew through that, but a decentering of the newspaper form and its conventions in favor of more personalized, biased, incomplete, pandering, funny, emotional, unreliable, and relatable modes of news transmission. That, and we're seeing that today. And it's something of a return, I argue, to the status quo ante, the world of spoken, song, and printed news culture, dominant for most audiences in Ireland and throughout Europe for many centuries. The image shows a bender of the Freeman's Journal, artist unknown from around the 1870s. And I find this image endlessly poignant and it was discovered by my wife, Catherine Ann Cullen, uh, in, her, uh, in her research on Joe Sadler, the blind street poet. And why, one of the reasons I find this so poignant is because he's selling a newspaper. His type were dying out as the newspapers were rising. He's got the Freeman's Journal in his hand um, instead of his own uh, set of his own ballots. Um, however, the Freeman's Journal is gone and most newspapers are following in that direction. And the messy new dispensation that we have at the moment, where the motto is less all the news that's fit to print and more whatever, whatever, you're, whatever, whatever gets to you, um, is not just about the loss of some mythic objectivity, but about a kind of omniscience, a loss of that kind of journalistic idea of omniscience and instead locating ourselves in the street. And so understanding that long history can provide some perspective on the evolution of policing and professional boundaries. And I'm hoping it can provide students some understanding of the history of news practice, including here in Ireland, making it more inclusive and less prescriptive. Removing the professional newspaper reporter and editor from the perch atop the history of journalism is a, of journalism is a risky business in the context of the way we teach it. It came into existence precisely to train them. But deposing them is an urgent task because the future of journalism, assuming it continues to exist in recognizable form, involves a decentering of legacy media and modalities that dominated the 20th century. It requires finding some way to include the myriad historical and contemporary media forms that thrive on entertainment, on partisanship, on passion and engagement, on salesmanship of the sort that you might found, find outside the gates out on the street. Thank you, Hatton, and bang on time as well. Very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> that that took some effort. It was ready to be about 35 minutes. Yeah. There. Yes. Don't go away. Okay. Stand there for questions. Any questions for anybody in the, in the hall, first of all? I better check for the online ones, too. You must have made an awful lot from that. Um, I need to go away and think about it. Yeah. One more question. Yes, yes. It's related to all of the things, for instance. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that. The, the, the fact that some of the lectures were taken. So yeah. <laughs> and I found myself with the ballot early in the morning, so excited to, to hear people about reading and all of that. But I found myself looking to those because of the particular things I look at, you know, the, the, the panels and so on. But um, I'm just wondering the extent to of, um, how the ballots lend themselves to coding. Because um, you know you're saying fake news and stuff like that in some ways, but those bits of real things are real warnings, uh, commentary in them as well. And I'm wondering about uh, the balladeers here, the specialists, uh, could talk about that, how the news is articulated, but also that sort of um, uh, the, the thing of being aware that you could get arrested from the Newgate or whatever for a week or whatever. So, Extent to which coding, uh, so the luxury of the copy houses that have the last yeah. spare, um, these people are at risk. Yeah. <laughs> so newspaper editors could know, be at risk too, I guess. The so, newspaper editors got locked up on occasion as well, particularly here in Ireland, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there was a TikTok, it's fascinating. You could stand, see the difference, you could see the contrast. <clears throat> And then watching the books. So I was just wondering uh, about that, that. We haven't talked today yet about coding and coding in the presence of a, a 
much theory of a military complex state is uh, original. For sure. And, you know, a coding really means, I guess, how meaning is made uh, by the audience as well as by the um, by the speaker. Right. I mean, if we're talking about coding, we're talking about a code that the, the two parties are in on. Right. So uh, and that goes back to a kind of a collective uh, idea, you know, that uh, the one that you introduced to us this morning uh, that, uh, about the, the champion potatoes are the are the land leaguers. Code code uh, for the land leaguers, I think, is a really good example of that. So the, the ballad singer who's singing about the land league, but talk, but pretending to be singing about potatoes. Uh, and I think that, uh, I, as you say, there's, there's a lot of people in the room who probably can say a lot more than I can about that that uh, that history of the disguise. Um, and but, the body, yeah, the body of the, and the reporters from an office. Yeah. That may be a good idea to have at the at part of the discussion at the end, but it sounds like it's time together. Yeah, yeah, well, indeed. Uh, I also will say that the next uh, our next event for the Center for Critical Media Literacy is a seminar about disinformation. Um, so um, uh, that might be on November first. So you might be interested in that. The um, uh, Oscar. Um, says that Andrew McShane sees the 17th century talk of broadsides and songs not as news as commentary, um, not as conveying the headlines themselves. And that's a that's a very that's a very interesting question and 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 I think ties in a lot to the new media because as we saw with with TikTok, that uh, that African American commentator talking about dementia in prison is is riffing off material that he's finding in other news sites. And we saw it with Joseph Sadler you know, talking about the news from Perugia, but, you know, debating and engaging with the Irish Times or the London Times, whichever it may be in that in that context. So I think that, um, however, I mean, I think it's also the case, I, and we, we know it to be the case, that there was not, uh, you know, there's not steadily through the 18th century um, printed newspapers that are aimed at a wide popular audience. You know, that the, the you know, that eventually emerges, but, the mass of people may have been hearing about news for the first time from the news ballad singer rather than hearing the ballad singer comment on it based on having read or heard the paper read to them already. Newspapers are simply just not, you know, certainly through the middle of the 18th century, not very popular uh, with certainly with the mass of people. And they really don't become a, a, a mass commodity until the late 19th century in any to any serious uh, uh, respect, the period of Poor Joe, Joe Sadler and the Freemans. Yeah, I think it's time to move on to the next paper. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>